All right, cool. Welcome, everybody. My name is Javier Garza. And um, today we are going to talk about the f this, this, call, this talk is the five steps plan for securing your APIs. If you are looking for a different talk, now is your time to run out. <laughs> All right. So my name is Javier Garza. I'm a developer evangelist at Akamai Technologies based in San Francisco, California. Although for my accent, you can hear I'm Spanish. Right. Um, I've been a long time at Akamai, and I'm working with customers in different roles, always like uh, um, customer facing and helping many large enterprises, uh, speeding up the website, securing the websites, and doing APIs at a scale. Uh, one of the latest customers I helped, they had uh, more than 20 billion API hits a day. All right. I'm also um, co author of the HTTP2 book. So if somebody has questions about HTTP2 or HTTP3, you know, feel free to come to me. I write a lot of blogs and um, I do talks. Last year I did around um, 25 talks around the world. But um, my motto is, my life's motto is share what you know, I'll learn what you don't, and I really uh, live by it. And, um, and uh, also, um, in parts of my hobbies are challenging workouts and, um, you know, Nonprofit volunteering. So every couple of years, I go to a poor country and I work with kids, usually in an orphanage or something like that, doing things that had nothing to do with computers. All right. So now that everything, now that you know everything about myself, let me know what I have in store for you. So we are going to divide this session in three parts. So the first one is going to be understanding the API or understanding attack vectors that happens with websites and APIs. So you need to know how the hackers do it to be able to protect. The second part will be, I will tell you, now that you know how they do it, you know how to mitigate them. And it's, for example, I'm giving you an example of a five-step plan that you can implement to um, protect against the most common API attacks. And the last part will be tell you some things that you can do to um, distribute API and the protections around the world so that it's very hard for um, hackers to really bring things down. Right? So let's get started with the first section, which is understanding um, the attack vectors. One thing, if you never uh, seen me before, I like to interact with people a lot, and I throw things to people. So usually, the people who want to get things, they come to the first rows. Right? So today, I have a few t-shirts and a tile. So I'm not going to throw all the way to the end, just for liability reasons. But uh, <laughs> the ones on the front will get something from me. OK? So let's start with with the beginning. Um, how many of you heard about the Web Almanac? Raise your hand. OK, this is when I throw something. Nobody heard about it? <laughs> Nobody knows what a Web Almanac is? What is your name, Jeff? <laughs> all right. So I have something. Well, the Web Almanac, I will keep it for the next question, all right? <laughs> the Web Almanac is a um, free report that was published a few weeks ago by a, few, uh, by a group of internet experts. And basically, they took information from the HTTP archive to publish um, you know, a great insights on the internet for 2019. So the information that you have here comes from another source that is called the State of the Internet Report. That is a report that Akamai uh, has been publishing for many years. The World Almanac only goes one year back. And you can see here in 2014, you know, if you analyze, um, so Akamai, in case you guys don't know, um, it's a large cloud distributed network. Many major uh, companies um, use it to deliver web traffic. And basically, it handles sometimes like a one third or one fourth of all the web and API traffic in the world. So we can get a lot of um, good statistics about what people are doing, what kind of attacks. We always get like a zero day exploits and stuff. Um, so in this case, you can see in 2014, five years ago, People, um, more than half of all the um, requests for Web and APIs were HTML, which means it's the markup language used for web browsers. You can see the first on the top is the um, JSON. JSON is a data format used for APIs. Five years ago, it was just 6%, right? So if we go to last year, you can see these changes big time. So now we have 83% of all the hits for webs and APIs last year. Uh, webs and APIs were um, JSON and XML. XML is not as much anymore. 
five years was around 26%. Now most people, JSON is the winner, all right? So you can see um, why is the reason that we have, why I see so many um, API calls? Well, one thing is mobile apps. People use mobile now for a lot more than we used to do five minutes ago. I don't see anybody here with a laptop. <laughs> well, one. <laughs> and uh, many people, or two, with uh, many more with uh, cell phones on their hands. All right, the other thing that um, there are around, I checked a statistic yesterday, there are around 26 billion of um, installed IoT devices, and that's, those IoT devices usually uh, communicate through APIs, and that's the big bump that we have seen on API traffic. And um, I saw a forecast that they say there will be at least 60 or so billion of API devices in, in the next uh, few years, so it's going to keep increasing a lot. So the mobile market is more or less saturated, everybody has a cell phone already, but everybody's getting more on IoT devices, especially in the industry. There are now IoT devices everywhere, all right? One thing, um, API traffic is getting a lot of attention from hackers for the reason because it's dominating now um, the market. So what are the challenges in API security? How many of you are developers? Okay, raise your hand. Okay, that's many more. All right. Uh, you. Catch. <laughs> All right. Good job. And who will say that? This is a 3XL, so um, <laughs> anybody is 3XL? All right. Good catch. So what um, we have most of you people here, raise your hand so you are developers. Anybody knows what developers love the most? There are two things that developers love the most. OK. Yeah. Catch with the laptop. You have to close the laptop. OK. That's the tile. Good, good catch. No, don't open the laptop again. <laughs> All right. So developers love two things. The first thing is, you know, to, for people to create great software, people who recognize their job, and the people use it, as many people as possible, all right? So that's one thing that people get rewarded a lot. And um, the second thing, anybody guess what the second thing that they, um, developers like? Well, the second thing is like everybody else, everything in, in life, like uh, hobbies, family, friends, and so on, so we are normal people at the end. So one thing that this caused the problem is, is um, let me tell you a story that happens, a real story that happens in a company that I know very well and probably happened in one of the companies that you work. Is um, this developer called Javier, I'm going to put this, uh, my name in it, created an API internally for, for the team, and we were a team of eight people. And um, before, we had to use a UI to create, to do a certain of, certain operations that took like a minute or so, so I, well, we created an API, and soon enough, you know, things run smoothly. In, you know, a couple of seconds, we got things done. And a few, um, you know, I discussed with people on my team. Everybody liked it, and I started using it. So um, in a company meeting, you know, people talk around. And all the departments, they heard about this great API. We don't have to use this all outdated um, UI to do things. So everybody start um, adopting this API, which was meant only for my team at the beginning. And one day, you know, in a company party, there comes this uh, VP of sales, and he says, you know, I talk with this super good customer, and um, turns out they have a problem using this, and I heard you guys have an API that, you know, solved this problem. Can I use it with this customer? I said, well, we can maybe do a non-disclosure agreement and let the customer use it. I can open a port in the firewall and I make it public, no problem. You know, one day done, this customer is super happy. And then a C-level executive hears about it. Wow, customers and partners are using this API. Let's make it available. I'm going to announce it in the next conference in one month. We'll make it available for everybody in the world. All right, so then at this point, InfoSec and DevSecOps hears about it. And they come to me or to you. And they say, what? You have an API meant for internal use that everybody, customers have been using for three, four months? Really? <laughs> All right. So you don't want to do this. One of the things you want is ensure the DevSecOps are 
already from the beginning engaging whatever you do. Sometimes even the most smallest API you think is never going to be used for other things, it will get reused. Another thing is it's, um, it's very hard to do sometimes uh, API security because of the different types of standards that we have. And web you know, has been for a long time. APIs have been for more than a decade, but only a few years ago people have really do an API first design. So um, for example, for authentication, some APIs I seen use basic authentication. Don't do it. Some APIs do API keys a little bit better, but not really secure. Then uh, you have JSON web tokens, OAuth, OAuth2, OpenID Connect, many different things. So there is not really one standard. It's just um, there are many different options uh, today. And the same for tools. There are not really many, many tools that you can uh, use compared with uh, websites and mobile apps today. And also the lack of expertise. You know, how many of you have an API expert in the company for everything? OK, no hands. Um, the other thing that is very difficult is to make APIs at scale. You know, made an API that serves, you know, maybe a couple of thousand users is pretty simple. You can do it even with your laptop, probably, and if you have a proxy layer in front. But doing something across the world that millions or maybe billions of people uh, do, and they use a hybrid cloud architecture, is pretty cl complex today. Especially if you use, for example, AWS and other um, different cloud computers, you need to glue them somehow. Okay, so that's the complicated thing uh, when you do things worldwide. And the other thing that is really hard is hard to stay up to date with vulnerabilities. Security is super hot topic right now. You know, everybody's talking about it, and for a reason. There are way more vulnerabilities than you may think. And um, it's very hard to stay up to date. You will need a couple of people to to just keep reading stuff. And um, this is a very important topic because hackers are focusing more and more on APIs, right? Uh, one thing I'm not sure if I mentioned, but um, I think there are around 400 APIs on an average enterprise, and they expect to grow to 600 at the, by the end of this year, which is not um, that long anymore. So um, one thing we see is four times more um, credential staff attacks on APIs compared to websites. And uh, sometimes, you know, web, when you get design web and mobile apps, uh, security comes already with the tools that you use. But for APIs, a lot of times come as an afterthought. And um, I'm going to give you a quick um, history class on security. You know, things, the biggest vulnerabilities that happened in, in the last couple of years. And you will see a common pattern in those, and we'll see how to fix those, okay? So um, Heartbleed is something that happened 2014. It was the biggest, uh, the first biggest uh, vulnerability that, that from one day to the other affected millions of web servers and chat and mail servers on the internet. It was because of the OpenSSL uh, implementation that many of those uh, servers used, like for example, Apache or Nginx that many of you probably used, don't raise your hand. Um, and as a, re as a result, you know, um, and I, I think also it affected TLS uh, later on on something called Drowned. If you, if you hear about it, it's a very similar one. So it's not only, you only not, not only need to secure your certificates, but it's very important to pay attention to, to things like a ciphers and, and other things. So Drowned is very similar, but happened last year. So we thought we'd learn about Heartbleed, but um, here we are again. And basically, if, in case you don't know, um, so the, the Heartbleed was uh, using um, SSL v3 vulnerabilities. And the Drown uh, affects servers that even are patched with SSL v3 or TLS2, um, TLS 1.2 or 1.3. But their server also supports SSL v2. And um, you share keys between the servers. So they could make a request to to a V2, crack the key, and then make a request to the, your certificate that uses a much secure um, algorithm like TLS 1.2, and then get in. Another thing, shell shock, you know, not sure if you guys heard, but this affects, for example, the bash shell. And the good, interesting from this uh, vulnerability is 
the day it was released, you know, um, on the CBE report, um, within hours of the initial disclosure, there was a massive attack of botnets. You know, they used this vulnerability to hack, um, to, to do DDoS then denial of service attacks. So um, it goes really quick. All the things that you probably heard about Poodle, Poodle, apart from being a dog, it was a man-in-the-middle exploit that basically um, takes um, vulnerability, use the fallback mechanism of, for example, browsers could tell a server to go down to, the server will offer when you do the TLS handshake, it will offer maybe a TLS 1.2, and the browser will say, no, sorry, I don't talk that, can you go down to SSL v3? And if the server says sure, then they will go over a not so secure um, protocol. All right. Um, Fappening, this one is very interesting. Uh, this one is like a multi scale um, security vulnerability that happened. It's also known as an iCloud leak of celebrity photos. And I think 200 uh, movie stars, especially women, look good looking women, uh, they were targeted by a person, uh, by a hacker, that basically he managed to get into the iCloud. Um, account. Um, some people say that it was do it a combination of phishing attacks, and I heard in a um, conference talk and an API security talk that um, Apple back then didn't have rate limiting implemented in some of the um, API authentication endpoints, and that mal um, helped the hackers, you know, do a brute force attack and get um, some of the passwords. So I think. Um, it was hard to find the real cause, but what I heard is a combination of phishing emails, you know, asking people to click on a link to reset the password, the iCloud password. If you get an email from Apple, it, Apple doesn't do that, so don't do it, don't click it. And then, you know, using an API they didn't have rate limiting to, to brute force attacks. This is very common today. So the more interesting thing from this attack is that um, once they get the iCloud um, credentials, they download in the whole library of iCloud photos that you probably have on, on iCloud. And they picked some of the uh, compromising pictures, and they tried to sell them in online image uh, forums like uh, 4chan or um, what was the other one? Well, in a couple of those uh, in exchange for bitcoins. Right? So that's uh, after a while, you know, some of the people who bought the photos just distributed without asking for money. And some hackers got these photos and used them for attacks on social network phishing attacks. So you say, click this, click this link to see pictures of this uh, celebrity star. So many people click there. And then their Facebook, Twitter, and PayPal accounts got hacked too. So it's like a, um, like a roller coaster kind of attack. One attack triggered the other. They benefit from each other. And this is not the last one. Um, Snapping is another one that happened on Snapchat not long ago, and this was really related with a third-party uh, API. So um, a company called Snapsafe, you know, well, in case some, somebody doesn't know Snapchat, although I'm pretty sure you, you know it's a service that you can send pictures to people, and after a few seconds they auto-distract, so um, nothing for posterity. So you can send funny pictures or um, all sorts of pictures and rely that nobody will keep it. So because people f wanted to keep those pictures, they had this third-party software, um, third-party application called SnapSafe, where you will put your Snapchat credentials, and they will save those pictures for you. Cool, right? Um, so hackers hacked the SnapSafe uh, database, and basically um, they downloaded, I think, 900,000 or 200,000 uh, pictures. And of course, they, found, they posted on 4chan, which is this um, image uh, forum, and that was a big uh, chaos on the press, all right? So the important thing is, although Snapchat use OAuth, I believe they use, for authorizing third parties, which is pretty good, pretty secure, you know, still, if the third party owns and get hacked, you know, they don't keep their API secure, you can still uh, suffer losses. And in fact, I believe the day after the leak was announced, Snapsafe uh, shut down the website and services. So it has a big impact on API. You can, it, cause, it can cause a great loss of, on your company or even a company to disappear. 
Um, if you want to learn a lot about API security, you know, um, I'm not going to go into more detail. This is the last slide that I have for you. But uh, the OWASP is the Open Web, um, open web appli Applications um, Project that we have on the Internet Security Project. And basically, for many years, they have released the top 10 vulnerabilities for web and mobile apps. And now they are starting to do the same for API security. So the list that you see here is the release candidate. You have the list there. Um, you have the list there, uh, the link, if you want to learn more. But these are basically what they are discussing with other members. And once they agree, they will do the final report with the top 10. OK, so the other thing that you need to understand is API security is not just securing the servers. You need to take a holistic view and secure all the different parts that you have uh, on, the, on the API usage, which is the first part is the client. Then you have the server on the, on the other side, and then the network in between. So you need to focus on all three areas. The client, you know, it's hard to secure in some parts of it because you don't own it. You know, as people like, a, like a you that you can decide what kind of uh, protections you put, if it's just a pin code or a fingerprint or a face scan or something, or if you share your passwords across websites, which is a very bad practice. I hope everybody here uses a password manager with random passwords. And there are password managers that even check if your password has been compromised and alert you. Okay? So that's very good. Um, and my company, for example, we give a, um, a password manager, the best one I, th I believe is in the market, to all employees for free, just so that they don't do stupid things that may impact uh, their company. All right? And also, if you've been in a conf big conference that was in San Francisco a few days ago, other big clouds, they are giving away security keys, you know, so that everybody um, uh, improves security. I'm not sure if AWS is doing as well, but uh, I'm pretty sure. Um, the other thing is sometimes you have to think also about the um, security on the mobile app. Getting the source code is um, one of the things that hackers do to, to ha before they hack something. They get a source code probably in GitHub and they try to see if they can find a way how things work and make a vulnerability, an attack. The other thing is many people forget to delete some keys from, for example, AWS or S3 when they upload things on GitHub. So it is not enough with um, remove them and commit the new file. You know, GitHub remembers everything. So if you do that, you know, you have to completely get rid of the repo and upload a new repo, all right? Um, the other thing is, you know, use, if you can, in a company, federated um, authentication models. So, for example, many people in the company has uh, many accounts for different uh, applications. When people leave the company, it's very hard to delete all these accounts. For example, we have always a problem when somebody leaves the company, you know, if we close all the accounts that they had access to, you don't really know. So a federated uh, system, like, a, for example, using single sign-on uh, with, with a two-factor auth app are very good because then you can just kill one account and it kills access to everything. So that's um, one of the things that you can do on the client side. On the network side, you, know, um, you need to ensure that you do encryption end-to-end -end from the client all the way to the um, servers. Some customers who really want to do this to the top, you, do, you can do um, Mutual authentication, which is client certificates, although that's very hard to do on a big scale. Um, all the things that you can do is ensure your certificates use the latest ciphers. I'm not sure if you know, but um, cipher, when you negotiate with a website and HTTPS connection, there is a um, certificate negotiation between the ones that the, um, your certificate offers. And then the end, end user's computer device needs to be able to negotiate the same ciphers. So um, that's very important that you use uh, new ones. Ensure that you use new protocols like TLS 1.2, or if TLS 1.3 is becoming uh, more and more popular now, uh, some, some uh, big companies are supporting that. Uh, you need to also take into consideration, for example, using newer protocols like a Quick and uh, HTTP3, which is coming very, very soon. And, well, of course, HTTP2, but quick, it's uh, better for um, 
low bandwidth and a lot of packet loss connections, and um, flow control algorithms and so on. In terms of the database and on the server side, you need to ensure that everything that you store on the database is encrypted. So if somebody hacks the database, they cannot decrypt keys and stuff. And um, you need to protect also the resources in terms of network connections, CPU, memory, and disk, right? Um, one of the ways to go and protect things are using um, positive security and negative security. Many people don't really understand the difference, but it's very simple. Positive security means you define what a good uh, request is from a good person and then let all those go and everything that is not go according to that gets blocked. Negative security is the other way. You define a rule so things that are not good, that should be a hacker or, or bad attempt and then you block those, right? So it's of course much more effective to implement positive security to block hackers but it's harder. So sometimes people go the easy way and implement negative security without the positive, right? Um, so, okay, so let me tell you quickly four areas where your APIs are most vulnerable. The first one is denial of service attacks. We start with this one because it's really easy to bring a large company down by doing this, um, especially if the company only uses like uh, servers that are in two or three data centers, right? Um, there are two types of uh, denial of service attacks. The first ones are called the targeted attacks where you have, for example, a hacker or a group of hackers that really target your servers via a booter service or some kind of a botnet network of billions of IoT devices, for example, that make a volumetric attack. And the other type is, you know, real users. For example, somebody makes a script to automate things and the script has a wrong parameter and instead of making a request per hour, it makes 1,000 requests per hour. Right? Or, you know, 1,000 requests per second, which will be uh, even worse. So those are the um, two types that we have. Uh, in terms of network connection, if you guys use AWS Linux instances, there is, you can check the Elastic Network Adapter that allows you to get a little bit more bandwidth of the connection. But as I tell, if you get 4 billion of IoT devices pound into one data center, even if you have 4 gigs or 100 gigs per second, it's going to be tough to, to hold the bandwidth. Parameter attacks, it's um, another way. You know, many people who design APIs, sometimes they configure a specific functionality that is not documented publicly to allow them to do certain things that they need internally in the group without having to maintain an internal and a public API. So this is unfortunately very common and everybody uh, thinks if I don't tell, people will know. But there are ways to figure out um, those hidden parameters, you can just try things that are obvious, right? So, and that's way um, they can get out of the backend system using those parameters. So remember, we'll go in detail later, more, uh, later on, but just sanitize everything before it goes to the server. SQL injection attacks, you can see 76% um, of all the attacks that we have seen on our firewall logs where SQL injection attacks, this is the most common attacks. And basically, they just try to get the data out of the database um, by using um, special uh, queries. So this is pretty easy to protect uh, with, for example, an API gateway or any other security um, applications in the market. But still, there are way too many um, vulnerable sites on the internet. Credential stuffing attacks, these are the ones that basically make most of the news. There, are, um, there were 28 billion credential stuffing attempts in the last eight months. These are attempts, and in fact, you know, there is a big percentage um, of all the API calls. I think it's 67% of all the login requests, they were not from the real users, <laughs> okay? Which is a very big um, number. Um, it's actually very simple to do. You can go to the darknet, you know, and uh, buy a um, fresh list of username and passwords for not that much money. And then you can run those across many, many websites and see if people share passwords and you get into their other accounts. So um, that's very hard to, to prevent. 
and um, we'll see later on some of the few things you can do to prevent this. But as an end user, yes, don't reuse passwords. Use um, um, unique passwords generated by a computer. The other thing on the APIs, um, things like you use to protect websites like uh, CAPTCHAs don't work because APIs are based to uh, computer to computer. So many times, all those things like to detect a human via JavaScript, you cannot really run it in a big area. So these are the four things where your APIs are most vulnerable. DDoS attacks, parameter attacks, SQL injection, and credential staffing. All right, so let's see how you can mitigate them. So there are several types of DDoS attacks. You have volumetric flooding, where you have, for example, tons of connections from billions of devices trying to uh, kill your network or the number of open connections that you have, the sockets. Um, all the process, for example, the um, CPU, memory, disk, and range attack when you, it's called like an amplification attack. You make a small request asking for a lot of information and then the web server is busy using a lot of resources to give you back information. And you can send a lot of those uh, small requests and really kill, kill a server pretty quickly. Um, volumetric flooding, you know, it's basically uh, you can overwhelm APIs by doing tons of API requests. And there are like a, a booter services that you can hire that you can basically, um, it, you pay per the number of uh, millions of devices that you use for the attack, and, um, and you can just click and dose somebody. So if somebody is protected by a CDN or so, you will have to pay way, way more. So sometimes it will not be efficient. But if somebody uses a couple of data centers, it's very easy to break them down by, by using something like this. And in fact, um, the Mirai botnet was very famous and made the news a couple of years ago because um, it use IoT devices that were hacked with default passwords to create this botnet and rent them on the internet. Uh, the mitigation for this, there are several ones. So again, DDoS is the easiest way for hackers to bring somebody down and cause a lot of damage. Uh, blacklisting IPs with C CIDR blocks is feasible, but I will not recommend it. It's uh, very hard. Um, attackers, usually they use tons of millions of devices even from valid uses, so it's not really efficient. Um, IP reputation list, in case you don't know, is a service that you can subscribe from some companies that they tell you when somebody comes to your website or use an API makes a request to you, based on the IP, what is the um, probability that is an attacker? And the way they do it this, and I know Akamai, for example, does it, is they aggregate, they measure basically the attacks from uh, millions of websites and basically they track the IPs that are used for those attacks and they give them a score. So the more an IP is used for doing different attacks, the higher the score is in the IP reputation. All right, so that's kind of efficient. Um, then rate limits, super important. You know, if a hacker, if it's too much effort for a hacker to try to uh, bring you down, it will take another company, right? So that's. Rate limits, quotas, and thresholds, something that is very important. It's very easy to implement and very effective. A slow post, um, you know, sometimes the API has rate limits and quotas, and you cannot attack it the way. Another attack that you have is you can make a request to an API in a way that goes super, super slow. In that way, if you have, um, you can open the, keep the connection open for a long time and use all the connections. So even if they have quotas or um, rate limit, you know, that's a way that uh, um, attackers use to bring down the service. Um, there is a slow post protection. Otherwise, it's uh, kind of hard to, to, to do this um, prevention. And authentication, for example, applying um, Client certifi certificates, so only clients who have the certificate can go to your app and, or your um, API and nobody else. The second is protect processes. Um, CPU uh, memory, it's, very, it's kind of expensive. You know you can scale and use more if you need, but as you scale servers and CPU, you have to pay for it. So it's very important uh, to ensure they don't get consumed a lot because they cost money. 
Um, they target CPU and RAM, has collisions, and malicious JSON, so that their API server takes a lot of uh, CPU, for example, to process the JSON. Uh, some way of mitigating that is, um, for example, some API gateways allow you to upload your Swagger or RAML definitions and basically put rules based on those so that um, on, on the edge of the internet, for example, you can verify uh, the maximum number of JSON objects or, for example, if an API endpoint only allowed get and post, you know, block automatically put and delete and they never made it all the way to your servers. Right. Range attacks and scrapping, it's another way. This is basically consists on sending um, valid JSON, but instead of changing the range to cause the server to, to speed a lot, of, um, a lot of data back. And sometimes you can even cause like a overrun and so on. Again, you, know, you can basically find out what is the normal range um, that users will use. For example, if you have a product database of 3,000 products or more, Amazon probably has way more, you know, there is nobody who is going to make an API request to download 200,000 products, right? So then you can put some ranges, you know, and define, for example, people may uh, ask for 1,000 the most, but not, you know, the whole catalog. All right, protect credentials. Protecting credentials is very important. On APIs, if you use OAuth, you are better suited because um, a stolen credential from a website will not attack. But uh, people are starting to share also tokens and API keys around. So um, it's, there are tools like this one that you see here is called Sentry MBA. Basically, you can load. Um, a file like the ones you buy on the internet, on the darknet, with thousands and millions of uh, username and passwords, and you can just sell the target. You know, I want to check those against this website, and they just run into it. So it's pretty easy to do a credential staffing attack. The mitigation is I'm putting from easier to harder. You know, good practices, again, tell users not to do you reuse passwords, use password managers? If you have API endpoints that do authentication, you know, don't hint to the users when there is a wrong username and password or a wrong API token on your API response. Okay, give something that uh, hackers cannot guess what type of authentication problem it is, while still giving a meaningful um, message that um, API developer can, um, who wants to integrate with your API can distinguish what the issue is. Um, rate controls is very important, you know, uh, quotas and rate limits, you know, especially on password related service authentication services uh, so that, you know, you cannot try many times to hack somebody's iCloud. Um, a strong authentication, you know, um, using two-factor auth, biometric and security keys, it's very important. And then human behavior detection, that's uh, something that many people doesn't know. But uh, you can use the sensors that are in uh, laptops and mobile devices to distinguish if a person is a mobile, if a real person or not. For example, you can put there um, SDKs for uh, mobile na native apps that you can tap into the accelerometer uh, of the cell phone and put a finger fingerprint on an API call telling if, if that behaves like a human or not. Because usually, um, you know, when you hold a phone in your hand, it vibrates a little bit, so the accelerometer picks up some data. And usually uh, bots don't do that as well. Okay, so those are. And the step five is uh, bot management. There are way more bots that you think they are on the internet. That's a big problem out there. Um, I've seen, um, well, you can see here, bots represent 50% of more of all the overall web and API traffic. I've seen, um, Customers I work with, big enterprises, especially in the retail, that more than 80 or 85% of all the um, traffic comes from bots. There are good bots and bad bots. So, you know, for example, you don't want to block a Google search or something similar that you want index, but there are many bad bots, so you have to be able to distinguish between them. Um, the mitigation is enforced quotas. 
and for example, not, don't allow bots to scrape the whole product database. Um, analyze the traffic and do this categorize so that you allow the people who you want to go. And then use a bot detection tool. You know, um, bots are very complicated. They adapt very quick. So the best is, you know, have somebody who, if you can afford it, of course, who do the bot investigation, updates always the bot list, and then you just consume them and can block uh, things easier. And um, the next thing is leveraging the edge. Uh, that's one way, when I say edge, I mean not your devices, but you know, um, basically the servers that run at the edge of the internet, usually one or two hops away from the end users. So when you are able to put the server logic, like you have in AWS, really close to the end users, that is then very quick. And if they get, in that way, you know, only the good traffic goes to your um, API infrastructure. So that's um, the edge of the internet. You know, many, there are many CDNs. Um, it's a content delivery network that offer um, different services. It's something they have evolved. Before it was just content delivery. Now they are into security, they do API gateways, and many other things, like, uh, for example, um, bot management and stuff. And the benefit of this is that it makes it really difficult for hackers to do things like a distributed denial of service attack, because now you don't have three API servers running in maybe East Coast, West Coast, and Europe, and APJ, but you have hundreds or thousands of API servers around the world, and each of them is doing the security and the um, validation of the data that goes to your real backend servers that they are um, hidden from the rest of the internet. Then you can apply like an IP uh, whitelist, and only those servers running at the edge can go to your real servers, right? In that way, it's way easier to, to provide an API that is really quick and secure. Um, why fighting atta attacks at the edge? Well, it's easier to deflect volumetric um, type of attacks. It's also um, better to scale. If your API is closer to the end users, the API gateway, you know, the API um, requests and response are much, much faster. You can catch some of those um, requests and response using things like a GraphQL, that instead of an API, for example, a mobile um, device have to do an API call, parse the response, and make two or three other API calls, you can um, use GraphQL to, to have that process um, do with one, one request and then cache it at the edge so that your database also doesn't have to get all the load for that. And then there are also machine learning um, things like, for example, the um, API IP reputation where those companies, they get attacked from tons of people, and they use the intelligence they gather and the machine learning to identify already somebody who is well known to attack somebody else and block it when they attack your API. Okay, so that's the benefit of the edge. Another thing, secure APIs is just not the security like everybody thinks. It, there is a lot of management included, like for example, talking in your company with developers and tell them what you learn here. You know, just don't keep it for yourself. Try to share it with others. And also, um, there is a lot of information about a um, lot of work on API management and policies and so on. So it's more work um, than you think. Um, there are API gateways to simplify this process. I believe um, AWS has one, Akamai has one, and many other companies. And basically, you can do, um, it makes much easier to manage and govern uh, OP, API um, operations. And for example, things you can do is rate limiting um, quotas. For example, let's say I give you one API key, and I can tell that in that API key, because it's a free tier, they are only able to make 100 requests a day, where there is somebody who pays much more, I can give a different key and give them a high, much higher quota. And, um, you can do also authentication. Authentication is very expensive because it uh, uses a lot of CPU and memory, especially for the encryption. So you can offload those to, to the CDN as well or to the API gateway and save um, on that side. And then you can do also rule-based defense shield at the edge. All right, so I'm going to do a demo. 
that a colleague of mine created. So I'm going to switch the screen. All right. Cool. And let me check. So this demo ran in um, So you can see it runs in AWS. So a colleague of mine basically set up some infrastructure to to test the uh, throttling. Let me make this a little bit bigger so you can see it better. Can you see well from the back? Yep. Okay, so let me explain to you first what we are doing here. So basically we have here an API gateway that runs on thousands of servers around the world. And um, the points that you see there on the map, there are locations where I run my API gateway, OK? So I have a script here on, on AWS, actually it's in the East Coast, that basically when I click one of those uh, points on the map, it's going to make, send a number of requests to, the, um, to those API server that I click, the API gateway. And basically, you can see here I have, um, I can have different keys. For example, I'm going to pick the key number 107, which will be a free tier, for example. And I say this key is only allowed to do 100 requests per second. Okay, so this is my threshold. And um, then the duration is, this is from the attacker's perspective. I'm going to see um, my script that I created in AWS is going to send for 30 seconds, 30 requests per second, right? To maintain that and um, try to see if we can um, bring the API down. You could use, do this type of attack with a botnet, for example. And uh, here in this graph, we are going to see a graph at the moment. Here you can see here, this is the limit. And here is the, this number will see the, nom nom the number of total requests. As I click, it will increase. Here in the um, orange, you will see the ones that are denied by the um, API gateway at the edge. And then the OK are the ones that get through. So this number should be as close as possible to 100, OK, because it's the limit that we have configured. The hard thing of doing um, something like this distributed across the world is you have to sync the counter of how many requests per second one unique API key is doing worldwide. So you have to sync all the API gateways in real time to share the same number so that they cannot fool um, and just by using different locations uh, overload the system and get more requests that they're allowed. So for example, I'm going to create here an LA. So you can see here the LA is sending 30 requests per second. You can see over there. 30 and OK is 30 because uh, that's what I allow. I'm going to click in Miami. You can see. Uh, now we see 60 requests per second, and there are 60 going through. I'm going to click, for example, here and here. And we can see now each one, each client makes um, 30 requests. So now we, start, we are going over the limit. And now the API gateway rules are starting to, to take effect. As you can see, you know, um, more or less, you can see 90, 92. Here on the top, they are getting through. And as the 30 seconds go down, you know that we stop denying the users that go above the limit. So you can see here, for example, I make a distributed attack against four API servers running in different places. I send um, 30 API requests per second. And once they reach the limit, the threshold kicks in. And I'm able to deny those extra requests that that API client was not supposed to do. So do you think that will work if I take um, a server that is really far away with a high latency? So let's try, uh, let's try it out. So I'm going to use um, PLA, Brazil, 
Dublin and Japan. That's as far as I get. So let's see. So it's ramping up. Each client is sending requests to those API gateways. And we can see they go uh, already over 100. And the accuracy, it says 91%, uh, 93%. It's pretty good. So you can see we allow 103 requests, around 100, and um, from the 120 total. Okay. And as the traffic goes down, we stop blocking, we stop denying, and, um, and the end user with the API key can keep doing the key. So this is one of the things that is really hard to do it uh, on a centralized way, uh, especially because of the high latency between the different locations. So it's um, pretty cool. So if you try an API gateway, try something like this, where you um, see if you can, how the API gateway reacts when you do requests from many different locations against the same quota, okay? Because just blocking a number is kind of easy, but doing it per user on a distributed scale is really, really hard. All right. Cool. So we are two more slides and we're done. So in a summary, you know, this is the strategy that you need to do to secure APIs. You first, analyze, you first start with analyzing the traffic. You need to know, um, do an inventory of all the APIs that you have and what they do, and the risks that are associated with each API. So you have, of course, to put more effort on APIs that have, for example, PI information, like uh, user logins and profiles and so on. Um, the second step is to secure. You have to start defining the things on your API design for how the authorization and authentication are going to work, you know, what kind of rate limiting quotas and so on you are going to do, what type of validation. Um, yeah, watch out for leak keys in GitHub or Kubernetes or Docker, things like that. Um, then you have to verify, basically test and ensure that everything is um, working as you expected, and then you deploy, and that's when you defend on, on, the real, um, on the real world. And once you have gone through that way, protecting both internal and external APIs, you have to go again and start analyzing logs and stuff to just improve it. It's just not one cycle, you have to go all the way. Every time there is a new security vulnerability, you have to go back and fix that, and you know, Secure that vulnerability, verify it, and deploy it, all right? And it's a cycle. Okay? So the plan that I have for you is not just talking. Now you have to act. Is Within seven days of today, if you have an API that you need to defend, you need to be able to um, assess, assess the threat uh, of the API, and uh, for example, go to websites like um, apisecurity.io, learn more about, the th about uh, API security. Um, within one month, you need to understand who is using your APIs and how and from where. And also define how you are going to secure them. Okay, it takes sometimes more than a month in a large enterprise. And within three months, you should start checking what kind of tools are available in the market and getting quotas of, or um, see how much they cost, how easy are they implement. Sometimes it's easier and cheaper to buy something than to do it yourself. Sometimes it's better to do it yourself. It depends on the situation. But basically, there are many security solutions. Um, within three months from today, you should hopefully be at this stage and drive and implement an API project to protect your APIs. All right, so that's it. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. That's uh, my Twitter um, account. So um, I will tweet the slides afterwards, and you can also, um, I already put it out there, and AWS on the website will make them available as well. So whether, that's where you can download it. If you want, you know, I'm going to stay here for a few minutes. Um, if you have any questions, I will also be outside afterwards, okay? Thank you.